Good to have you with us on this Wednesday edition of Ed Schultz News and Commentary. The French president making the rounds, getting support as he met with the president yesterday. He'll meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin today. And this is going to be an interesting effort, so to speak. The uh, sanctions on Russia with Crimea and the Ukraine are going to be up at the end of next month. Can this coalition fighting against ISIS hold together and also these sanctions be in place, in, staying in place? This is a tightrope walk, I think, for the French president. Yesterday, President Obama lending his support and the United States' effort to fighting ISIS with the French. We've got a coalition of 65 countries who've been active in pushing back against ISIL for quite some time. Russia right now is a coalition of two. Iran and Russia supporting Assad. But I think it's important to remember that you've got a global coalition organized. Russia's the outlier. Uh, we hope that they uh, refocus their attention on what is uh, the most substantial threat and that they serve as a constructive partner. And what will be Russia's retaliation now that the Turks have shot down a Russian fighter? One of the pilots has been recovered. But the question, the big question is, can we defeat ISIS and can we remain safe as a globe and do it this way without ground troops? The Republicans, of course, are hecklers from the stands. They, of course, say the president isn't doing the right thing. We're not doing enough. There's not enough drones, not enough airstrikes. And, of course, we can't get this done without boots on the ground. I, I don't have those answers. Most Americans don't. Who's been correct on the Middle East from this country for decades? Not many. Colonel Jack Jacobs, retired MSNBC military analyst, joins us. Colonel, good to have you with us. Hey, hi, Ed. What can be done more than what we're doing right now without boots on the ground? And, and your thoughts on this 65-country coalition the president's talking about? Well, the short answer is nothing more. I'm, you know, any military person will tell you that if you want to defeat somebody on the ground, particularly an outfit like ISIS that is focused on terrain, their whole ideology requires them to control terrain. Uh, airstrikes are not going to do it. You have to have people on the ground to seize and hold terrain once the airstrikes and artillery and all that stuff uh, have done their job. But we're not going to do that. We don't have any political will to do that. We wasted a decade or more in the Middle East not getting done any of the things that we said we were going to do. And actually, uh, 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 increasing the turmoil in the region. What's really required here is a multinational force that's composed not of Americans or even NATO, but of the the countries in the region that actually have a vested interest in seeing uh, the place calm down. That includes Egypt, for example, as a great air force. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, huge air force with American equipment, American ordnance, Iran even. But but uh, uh, they don't have seem to have much interest in getting involved, and they're sitting on the sidelines, and they're not going to contribute. But the short answer is, bombs alone are not going to do anything to anybody, and we're not going to send 100,000 or 200,000 troops there for a decade or more in order to secure the area. So it's going to require a great deal of diplomacy to forge a real coalition of people who are actually going to do something, not just uh, mm -hmm. countries, the 65, who are kind of interested in seeing what happens there. Colonel, your thoughts on the aftermath of the Russian pilot being shot down by the Turks? Well, you know, the, the, the Russians have violated Turkish airspace many times before, been yelled at before, and they continue to do it. What the Russians are doing, uh, and what the Russians were doing when the aircraft, when their uh, uh, Su-24 was shot down, were bombing Turkmen, uh, Turkish ethnic people who are living in Syria, and who are more or less protected by the Turks. And they've been doing it for some time violating the airspace for some time, and I think the Turks just decided that they'd had enough. The Su-24 was actually in Turkish airspace for about four seconds, but uh, that was enough to take it down. Uh, that causes a great deal of difficulty there, particularly 
between Russia on the one hand and Turkey on the other, who ostensibly, except for the fact that they're one supporting Assad and the other one is not, Mm -hmm. uh, who are uh, actually inextricably intertwined in a great number of ways, including economics. So this is a big problem now, much more for Putin than it is for Turkey, because Putin's kind of painted himself into a corner with a a wide variety of... uh, of adventures that are not panning out very well, Ed. How do you think the president's playing Vladimir Putin right now? I mean, he's, you know, isolating Russia in a sense, saying that they're with Iran and we've got 65 coalition countries who are fighting ISIS, although uh, Russian, Russia is hitting uh, ISIL targets in Syria. So how do, this, this is a, a very strange dynamic that's unfolding here. And the backdrop of this is what's going to happen to the sanctions that are going to expire next month due to the actions of the Russians in Crimea. Will that coalition hold together? I mean, the, the French play a key role here, don't they? They do indeed. This is an interesting boxing match. You know, there's a lot of rope-a-dope on both sides here. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that the sanctions stay in place. I think we're going to use the sanctions. The West is going to use the sanctions as, uh, as bait, as trade bait, to get uh, Russia to... Uh, to participate in knocking out ISIS, but, you know, Russia doesn't care about ISIS. Their sole, well, they care about ISIS only as an enemy. Their sole uh, uh, objective here is not even to keep Assad in in power, but to keep Assad in power long enough for both them, the Russians, and Iran to have a seat at the table when all the all the fighting starts they already know that assad's going it's just a question of who's going to be in control of uh, of syria once assad goes and it want they russia wants it to be russia um so we're on the wrong side if what we want to do is team up with russia to knock off isis uh, that's not going to work because our objective to get rid of Assad is totally and completely different than Russia's objective, which is to keep Assad in place long enough for Russia to to influence the outcome. I I, I have to say that we painted ourselves into a corner too. We're kind of inept. We're we've turned out to be the world's scold. We tell people how to live their lives, and it's not just this administration. Previous administrations have done the same thing. I remember when Bush said, "Everybody loves democracy." That's where we're going into Iraq. Well, you know, everybody obviously doesn't love democracy, and even those who do are not necessarily willing to fight for it. Trying to convert the rest of the world into images of uh, Republican democracy as practiced in the United States uh, clearly doesn't work. And now, by saying that we're not going to do, we're, we're implacably wedded to the notion of Assad's going, and we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that he goes. Puts us puts us at odds with potential at, uh, uh, allies here in getting rid of ISIS, who is by most measures a far more potent threat than Assad uh, in Syria is. Ed. Certainly seems like it. There's no question about it. Colonel Jack Jacobs, always great to visit. Thanks for your insight. I appreciate it. Thank you. A delight, Ed. Thank you. As far as fighting ISIS is concerned, have you noticed that President Obama isn't doing anything correct? According to the conservatives, I mean, the hecklers are out and about. They're throwing popcorn from the stands. But I just want to point out, there is no march. There is no chorus across this country that says that we have to put boots on the ground to defeat ISIS. We're doing more airstrikes than ever before. And may I point out that we have not been hit at home by ISIS. It's as if the president isn't doing anything correctly. And I'd like to know from the biggest heckler, the fat guy from New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie, who doesn't know his ass from third base, while he's asking the president all these questions and telling him what to do at his speech yesterday at the Council of Foreign Relations in New York, maybe Mr. Christie can tell us when was the last time he had an NSA briefing or a CIA briefing or a briefing at the Pentagon on what we're doing in Iraq and Syria when it comes to fighting ISIS. The fact is, it's his opinion. He doesn't know his ass from third base, but he's a pretty good salesman. Here he is yesterday. I would be fascinated to see the president go to Paris and speak to the families who lost their loved ones 12, 13 days ago and tell them that ISIS 
It's just a group of killers who are good at social media. It'd be fascinating to see the Secretary of State go to those Parisian families and tell them that ISIS is not 10 feet tall. This is just a transparent attempt to justify a failed policy. A failed policy. It's always a failed policy. Was it a failed policy for the Bush administration to disband the bin Laden team that was going after him? And then President Obama had to come in and mop it up. And in a debate against Mitt Romney, he said that if we had actionable intelligence and if the Pakistanis were not willing or unable to go after Osama bin Laden, that he would get it done. He made that call. Isn't that fascinating? The fact of the matter is, everything the president has said he was going to do against ISIS is exactly what he's doing. Now, Governor Christie, if you want to send your kids to the military and put boots on the ground, go right ahead. But the country's not with you on that. Not yet, anyway. And the fact is that we are getting cooperation from the French, from the Brits, and even the Russians, as adversarial as they have been at times with this president. There is a worldwide coalition that is going after ISIS. Maybe not at the speed that you run, Governor, but the fact is the job is getting done and we are protected at home. I was in New York City yesterday. There's cops everywhere. There's security everywhere. People are going about their lives and their businesses. This country is not going to be intimidated by ISIS. But it's the Republicans in this country who want to gin up fear and make sure we know that we're just not doing anything correctly. When we come back, former Senator Byron Dorgan checks in on the world events. And also, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson will be here on some of the unrest that's unfolding in Chicago and Minneapolis. That's next on Ed Schultz News and Commentary. Stay with us. Hey, folks, you've heard me talk about BioGreen Clean. I'm going to show you right now on my airplane just how tough this is. I want you to keep in mind, chemical-free, 100% plant-derived, biodegradable. It is the safest cleaner that you can get, and it's the most effective. Go to our website, wegotahead.com, or go to biogreenclean.com. www.biogreenclean.com, and order today. It's time to continue our conversation about mechanical insulation. Mechanical insulation is for the piping systems in our nation's commercial and industrial facilities. Facility owners are burning up billions of dollars through the lack of mechanical insulation on these piping systems. Call the iSave team. Insulation saves America valuable energy, and this team of energy conservation specialists is shovel-ready to save you money. Visit iSaveTeam.org to have a specialist give your plant an energy audit. We perpetuate a culture of crime all the way from Wall Street right down to the Main Street in our hometowns. It's worse than it has been since FDR took control of the problem and said we can't count on industry taking care of the American labor. They probably have already engaged into some type of criminal cover-up. And the law prohibits the government from even doing anything about it. Catch America's lawyer Mike Papantonio on YouTube at youtube.com slash goleftv. Good to have you with us here on Ed Schultz News and Commentary on this Wednesday edition. Joining me now is former Senator Byron Dorgan. Senator, good to have you back with us. Thanks, Ed. Good to be with you. Lots of crazy stuff going on right now. And there's not a whole lot happening in the House and the Senate when it comes to fighting ISIS other than hecklers from the stands right now. Mm -hmm. I, want your, I want your thoughts on the president seeking... Uh, authorization of military force, but he's not getting it from the Congress. What, what does this mean from your perspective? Well, as you know, nothing is happening in Washington that would require some uh, uh, ability to work together. I mean, it's just the, the, the issue of compromise seems to be an issue that is, is just off the table. But, uh, you know, on the Middle East and fighting ISIS and dealing with all these issues, um, my feeling is that the fewer American flags we plant in the sand of the Middle East, the better. That doesn't mean we shouldn't provide some significant leadership in lots of ways with our allies, but sending an American fighting force uh, right into the cauldron of the Middle East um, makes little sense for this country. Uh, there's no evidence at all that that is what is going to solve the issues of the Middle East. So, you know, I, I hope the president is cautious. I hope we provide leadership and hope we work to put together coalitions and so on. But uh, 
you know, this ISIS issue, ultimately the Middle East is going to have to resolve much of this um, in the Middle East. The uh, terrorist attack on Paris and the involvement of the French now and the airstrikes by the Russians, uh, is this going to help the coalition? Is this going to, and, and what, do you, what kind of an effect do you think that this would have on NATO or, or upping the ante to go after ISIS? How do you think this plays? Well, this is, you know, the attack uh, in Paris is changing a lot of things. Just as, for example, when ISIS was uh, on video uh, beheading people, uh, you know, that kind of savagery and, uh, and the, the, the beheading of uh, captives um, on video, it had a profound impact around the world as a method of communicating from, the, from ISIS. The same is true with respect to the attacks in Paris. I, I, I find it really interesting, you know, the... The issue of the uh, refugees, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the Paris attacks, the refugees, uh, uh, the question about whether some uh, some terrorists might come in with refugees to various countries, um, and, and the call politically to close borders, and uh, someone suggested let in only Christians. I mean, it is so Byzantine, it's just hard to describe it. Do you remember when we had the Ebola scare? Yeah, uh, we had this, uh, some of the same people were the first out there saying we've got to shut down the American borders. You know, uh, it is so thoughtless in terms of how some of these people approach these issues. These are serious, difficult issues, and it requires grown-ups to think through them and come up with but, solutions that make sense for our country. Well, if unless I'm mistaken, every single uh, Republican candidate, um, other than Trump, is saying put boots on the ground in the Middle East. Uh, That's what, it, there, there, there is no political appetite or political will in this country to see that happen. So how does that play in this election year? But many of those who talk about boots in the ground, they, they've talked about boots in the ground with respect to every trouble spot in the world. I mean, you yeah. just add them up. It's always boots in the ground. You know, again, I think that the American people have little appetite for that. It doesn't mean that we should withdraw from the world. It doesn't mean we shouldn't provide some significant leadership. But look, uh, no country that I'm aware of has been successful sending invading armies to, uh, or sending armies rather, into, uh, uh, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. And, and uh, sending boots on the ground, a lot of boots on the ground to Syria, boy, that, in my judgment, that is a serious, serious mistake for this country. And again, Ed... There are a lot of ways to, to provide significant leadership for this country. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I hope that the president is working through that. He's, he's quieter than people would like him to be. But you know what? In the face of all of these Republican candidates saying, send troops, send boots to the ground, frankly, I'm kind of pleased that the president is saying, you know what? That, we're not going to do that. We're, you know, we're, we're, we've got a strategy. We're working through this strategy. The fact is ISIS has less territory now than they had before. Uh, obviously, the Paris attack uh, has ramped this up a lot, and it's a serious issue, but uh, this country needs to be involved, but not with boots on the ground. In Senator, Byr Senator Byron Dorgan, always good to visit. Thank you, Byron. Appreciate it. We'll do it again. You, you bet. Thank you. Lots of unrest in Chicago and in Minneapolis. When we come back, we'll take a look at what happened overnight, and also Michael Eric Dyson, Professor at Georgetown, joins us on What is the Remedy? Stay with us. Ed Schultz News and Commentary brought to you by Communication Workers of America, Alliance for American Manufacturing, BioGreen Clean, and the iSave team. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers room, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America.
Good to have you with us here on Ed Schultz News and Commentary. This year, 2015, I think is going to be remembered as a year where protests and minorities who are fighting for social justice and their clashes with police have just gone absolutely overboard. There are two cities in the spotlight right now, and that's Chicago and also Minneapolis. In Chicago, a police officer, Jason Van Dyke, 37 years old, has been arrested and brought up on first-degree murder charges for the killing of Lawan McDonald, and this was a year ago. This police video, the dash cam, was released, and of course, residents are furious because it shows him being shot 16 times. This is police chief uh, Jerry McCarthy talking about last night's incident. Do people have a right to be angry? People have a right to protest. People have a right to free speech, but they do not have a right to commit criminal acts. And at the end of the day, the Chicago Police Department is trained for, and we're one of the world leaders in mass demonstrations. We're prepared to facilitate people's First Amendment right to free speech, but we will be intolerant of criminal behavior here in the city of Chicago. And we expect that we're going to have community support to facilitate uh, whatever protests come our way. And I'm really confident in the community as far as being behind us. It all sounds good, but the videotape is ominous and the actions in the street and the unrest that's taking place has to be addressed. And their issues have to be addressed. I, I go back to this. I go back to education. I think when you're picking and choosing neighborhoods, when you're shutting down schools of low-income neighborhoods, it sends a real message. And that's where the unrest in the heart and the soul begins and it changes a community and everything is intensified and everything comes under the microscope and who knows where it's going to end but cooler heads must prevail and issues must be addressed for more on this i want to turn to my great friend dr michael eric dyson who's a professor at georgetown university also he's author contributing opinion writer for the new york times michael good to have you with us Ed, always good to be on with you, my friend. And what? How do we throw cold water on this? What? What? What is the issue here? We've also got Minneapolis uh, burning with unrest as well, and we'll get to that in a moment. But what, what's happening here, and what's the remedy, Doctor? Well, you just made a brilliant point about linking all of these things together. Neighborhoods that are demoralized, that are um, you know seen as something that's disposable, get that message, and they internalize that, Ed. And on top of that, when the police chief says we are intolerant of crime, he means of everyone except perhaps his own police force, because this young man was mowed down in cold blood. The fact is, I wish the police would finally say, he did say that people have a right to be angry and the like, but we are intolerant of. Start with your own police force. Say we are intolerant of this kind of behavior that appears to be morally reprehensible, and we will begin there. And then we will also demand the same thing of the citizens of this particular city. It seems to me that the police are, are intolerant of the no-snitch policy among citizens in this country, and yet they are tolerant of no-snitching among themselves for a year. This video was held in, in, in safekeeping. The police who saw that knew what happened, and yet they came with the same um, narrative they've always had. I was afraid of my life. This young man didn't uh, cooperate with the police, and as a result of that, we had to kill him. The, po the, the black people in Chicago and across this country have very little faith in the ability of the police to exercise their justly sworn duties to uphold the law, to protect, and to serve. And as a result of that, you see this kind of carnage going on and the kind of social protest that overflows where the anger of the people uh, engulfs communities. And those legitimate rights, as the police captain said, uh, chief said, and I'm glad he said it, to protest sometimes then transmogrifies and gets uh, real nasty uh, in terms of the lethal intensity of the, what the people feel. So you said something brilliant here. Let's talk about education of the, of the police department and of the broader uh, uh, citizenry. Let's talk about the, the economic and social injustice that they confront. Let's talk about warehousing people so that they become, you know, you send them to detention as opposed to trying to figure out what their problems are, and then they go to jail. I, I, just, to I, I, I just think, uh, Doctor, that the eroding of society, the eroding of opportunities, 
the absolute choosing and picking of, of neighborhoods of who gets resources and who doesn't based on property Man. tax is, is, is just is the birthplace of all of this crap that's going on. Well, now, there's no uh, doubt about that. And then when people are, you know, in these densely uh, populated areas where little resources are, are to be had, then you see a predictable outcome of heightened crime and a predictable outcome yeah. of, the, of the inability of the police to really use community policing to deal with these neighborhoods. Community yeah. policing, Ed, has been proved to work far better than bringing in people who have no relationship to a particular community to police it. In the city of Minneapolis, there has also been a shooting and a death, and uh, there have been multiple protests in, in recent days. Misty Knorr is a spokesperson for Black Lives Matter in Minneapolis. She calls the shootings on Monday evening a planned hate crime. Here it is. What happened last night was a planned hate crime and an act of terrorism against activists who have been occupying the 4th Precinct to demand justice for Jamar Clark, a black man shot and killed by the Minneapolis Police Department. Despite earlier statements from police about the impending threat from white supremacists, the police instead made citizen journalists and peaceful protesters. They made disparaging comments to those at the protests instead of taking the threat seriously. We reiterate that we have zero faith in this de police department's desire to keep our community safe. It's almost a science right now on how to handle crowds after a police shooting. This is new territory for America, but it's commonplace. Put it together for us, doctor. No doubt. I mean, uh, the young lady spoke eloquently there um, about the fact that if you've been informed that these uh, people who are white supremacists are going to be in the neighborhood to cause uh, a stir, yes, again, we have first right amendments of people to peacefully assemble, but you also have to be aware of the potential for violence that comes not only from the people who are gathered, but from those people who seek to interrupt the duly, um, you know, the, the, the rightful pro uh, right to protest. So um, I think, first of all, we've got to acknowledge that. Secondly, you said something important there again. We've developed this science of dealing with crowds that gather to protest their right. And so, again, what we have to see is that, on the one hand, we've got to balance our ability and our need and our right to say what is going on is wrong, it's problematic, and must be addressed. And on the other hand, obviously, communities are concerned about safety and the like. But when you spoke earlier about these same factors being there, lack of resources, lack of public attention, uh, the refusal to acknowledge that what's going on here is wrong. It's like what happened in Katrina, Ed, uh, when, we, when we said then, over 10 years ago, that if this had happened in a whiter, richer neighborhood, this kind of thing would not have been tolerated to, for, for citizens to be left behind. Well, it wouldn't be tolerated for this kind of occupation by a police force in cities where the real justice is arrest the people who do the wrong, that's undeniable, at the same time treat Treat people with human decency and respect. And when we have images like the one in uh, Chicago where the young man is basically shot down in cold blood, and in Minneapolis where, again, peaceful protesters are being assaulted by uh, gun-wielding white supremacists, we have a problem in this country, and we have got to confront it directly and head-on so that we can balance the need for safety and security of all with the demand for the rightful, uh, uh, the, the rightful place to protest the injustice that occurs. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, always great to visit. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it very much. We'll do it again. Love you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, uh, all right. Always great with us. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, opinion writer for the New York Times and also political analyst for MSNBC and professor at Georgetown. This is Ed Schultz News and Commentary, brought to you by Communication Workers of America, Alliance for American Manufacturing, BioGreen Clean, and the iSave team. Have a great Thanksgiving. We're going to take a few days off. We'll be back with you on Monday morning.